Hi, it's Kerry Jeffrey here from Emotional Autoimmunity, navigating the emotional side of autoimmune disease. And today I'm really excited to be talking to Kerry Hafford all the way over from Maine in the United States. So really looking forward to talking to you, Kerry. And I'll tell you a little bit about Kerry before we get started. So Kerry Hafford was born and raised in rural northern Maine and she graduated with a BA in biology with a focus on biomedical science. Kerry currently works at her alma mater as a transfer officer in the registrar's office and she's also certified in advanced Reiki techniques. And Kerry has three suspected autoimmune diseases including celiac disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and HS but only one of those has been actually recognised by her primary health care provider. So Kerry, lovely to talk to you. How are you today? I'm doing very well, actually. It's busy. It's just before the start of the semester over here, the fall semester, um, and students are on campus bustling about. Fantastic. So let's get started with the questions. Now, I mentioned that you have three suspected ones, but only one sort of that's actually been recognised by your doctor. So can you tell us a little bit about your autoimmune diseases and the symptoms and, and how you've gone about sort of finding out what you have? Um, a lot of it came from working with a chiropractic doctor here in Maine. Um, chiropractic doctors, unfortunately, aren't allowed to do a lot of formal diagnosing or run lab tests, but they are often very good at looking at function or malfunction in the body. Um, and I got to the point last May when I was so sick that I had nothing left to lose by going to somebody in an alternative medical capacity. Um, and so that's what I did. And the one that my primary care physician had picked up on before was my HS, my skin condition that I have. Um, and that was by mere chance. She had done a paper on it in her um, master's work. Um, so that was the only reason why she knew what was going on with me. Um, the other two that I'm suspecting I have but don't have formal conclusions are celiac disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Oddly enough, my lab tests for Hashimoto's um, are all there. It, it's showing very high levels of autoantibodies. Uh, my TSH was very high yet the label itself has yet to come. Mm. And isn't that frustrating when you've got the evidence and you've got the proof there, but you just can't get that official recognition from your physician actually what's going on? I think there's a problem that they don't know what to do with it. Mm. Um, I'm being referred to an endocrinologist on the traditional medicine path, um, as well as seeing my naturopath out of my own choice. and when I asked my doctor, what should I be asking the endocrinologist about? Why are you sending me? The answer was, I don't know what to do with you. And this is just the next step. It's the next protocol. Mm. And that's a story that I hear so often in the thyroid support um, forums that I'm in on Facebook that a lot of people say they go to their, their doctor with very clear signs and, and the test results and then the doctor just looks at them and says I really don't know what to do for you I'm going to send you off to somebody else and that cycle can keep going for quite a while can't it? Yes it, it can and in a sense I'd hate to say that it's better than some of the reactions that I got with my HS um, because it usually manifests in areas such as the groin, the underarm. Um, I had one f older female doctor actually that was quite irate about how my body was reacting and it was almost like it was my fault. I needed to clean better, I needed to use different washing products, I needed to stop shaving, um, which granted can assist or um, make the issue worse but that's not the actual root cause. And I was made to feel like I was dirty and doing something wrong with my body when I was, in fact, just the opposite. Mm, mm. And we know that autoimmune disease, you know, is, is for life. And so getting, having something like that, I, I remember talking to Joanna Frankham for my very first interview, and she has HS as well as her primary 
autoimmune disease and she reported exactly the same situation that some doctors had made her feel dirty that you know and sort of suggested she wasn't washing enough and and things like that and because it does manifest in in such you know sort of private areas um there is a lot of feelings of shame and embarrassment that can come with something like that i mean has that been your experience it was when I was growing up, looking back, um, my chiropractor and I have pinpointed that I probably started experiencing autoimmunity symptoms when I was seven. Mm. That's 20 years of symptoms now. Um, mm. And I was an athlete in school. I was a fat athlete. Um, and I played two or three sports a school year. But I would have a hard time changing in front of the other girls if I was having a flare um, or I would be very uncomfortable wearing a bra because of the um, HS under my arm, and I would hide. And going swimming or going to the beach is not something that I enjoy, um, just because I feel the need to cover up something that I wouldn't want to explain to strangers. Mm -hmm. And growing up with that, I mean, 20 years, that's, that's a long time, particularly in your formative years when you, you're so vulnerable as a child, aren't you, to teasing of other people I mean when you finally found out what you had what was the feeling that it gave you to did it help you to be able to cope with that I went on a roller coaster for about the first four hours after my first chiropractic appointment um, she was the first person to look at me and say you are not fat and lazy and just need to to get up and work out she mm. said you are sick and you are putting on weight and you actually cannot be exercising right now because we need to work on your adrenals and we need to get you feeling well enough to do mm. that um that was the first validation i had ever had oh um, that must have been fantastic such a relief to hear that it's not you it's actually a disease yes and but then there was also the anger with that of just recalling all of the times that you've been told that it is your fault um, or not having somebody take the time to look into anything else and just writing you off yes so it's that balance of i i now know what this is and i have some some tools to deal with it um, but you also have to get over everything that has happened to you up to that point mm. exactly Exactly. So with the other two suspected um, diseases that you have, how has that changed things for you? I mean, you, you pretty much know you've got hashies. The evidence is, is clearly there in, in the labs. How has that changed your approach to, to life? Um, a lot of dietary change. Uh, when I was first working with the chiropractor, she put me on the autoimmune paleo diet. And that did wonders to getting me back to whatever my baseline is. Mm. And she said, we are doing the autoimmune paleo diet, but essentially it's the carry diet. Uh, what works well with your body? So for me, we found that coffee and cocoa did not need to be taken off my list. Um, and then later on, eggs, I, I don't have a reaction to. But she made it very clear that Although I should look into the literature and understand why I may want to avoid certain food, that it really should be what does Carrie react to and what she doesn't react to. Um, so there's been a food shift, which is interesting with the family culture and dynamics, um, especially the first few holiday seasons where I'm learning how to cook a different way and my family is trying to adjust as I'm pulling things back into my diet and throwing things, other things out. Um, going out to eat is, is interesting and also um, what I chose to do for a career. I used to work in admissions, recruiting, traveling around. It's very difficult to have that kind of travel stress on your body, not necessarily knowing where you can get safe food or safe groceries. Um, so I actually chose to still remain in higher education but work more at a campus-based position 
Yes, and there's a lot of different adjustments that we have to make, isn't it? Particularly when you are on a specific diet and, and as you say, that the biggest thing can be finding a place where you can safely eat and know that you're not going to get the repercussions because the, the repercussions, you know, to a lot of people who don't understand using the AIP or any other sort of diet um, to help heal the inflammation, the repercussions of getting a wrong meal can be really huge, can't they? I mean, what do you experience if, if you eat something that your body reacts to? Um, I find that gluten and nightshades are my largest reactive sources. For the gluten, I, I almost come down with the stomach flu and it can be anywhere from a couple of days to a week before I can recover. So not am I only experiencing the digestive issues, the pain. I'm also getting the achy joints, the brain fog. I'm clumsy. Um, I can't put words together. And when you have to try to work through that or explain to a coworker possibly why you can't come in today because of something you ate, it can be embarrassing. Um, and you can be hard on yourself, especially if you have the sort of work ethic where you're like, no, I need to get up and go to work. Um, and with the nightshades, that really bothers my HS um, to the point where within an hour, I can be experiencing symptoms. Um, so it's, unfortunately, HS is something that tends to take maybe a day or two to really build up into um, something that is a painful flare, but it also can take months for that flare to calm down. Um, so it, there's a lot of, of different types of pain involved in eating the wrong foods. And what sort of impact, I know you mentioned before, sort of going through the holidays, you know, the first time when you were changing your diet and trying different foods. How did you go about, Kerry, talking to your family about what you had and the changes you had to make and, and how did they take that? I mean, how did you negotiate that with them? <laughs> um, I actually have a wonderful family and the afternoon of my appointment was Mother's Day weekend and we were all planning on meeting at my sister's house um, to have a Mother's Day weekend with my parents and my brother, my sister and brother-in-law. I walked in and I set a bag down on the counter that had about $200 worth of multivitamins. Um, <laughs> when to take what? Um, how many of this, which foods that I absolutely needed to avoid. And they just kind of went deep breath. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I have a, a list on my parents' fridge right now that says what Carrie can and can't have. Um, I actually do a lot of the cooking when I come over. Um, I was a good cook when I was a normal cook, and it's just challenged my culinary skills, but it, it has been interesting when I've been on the strict autoimmune paleo, um, trying to do a reboot. I've done that once just because I realized that some things have come into my diet that probably shouldn't have. Um, they go through the growing pains with me, and so for that, I'm thankful. That's fantastic, fantastic. And when you were talking before, Kerry, about your experience with doctors and, you know, some of them were negative and, and quite hurtful and emotionally hurtful, looking back now, what do you think you would have done differently when it comes to dealing with the medical profession with the knowledge that you have now about your condition and what's really wrong with you? I don't know if there was anything that I could have done. And I don't like saying that, but even with a biology background, even actually going into clinical lab science at one point to be the person running these tests, I didn't know what to ask. I trusted in my physician. I trusted, I trusted in the system. And that was all that I could do with what I had at the time. Um, knowing what I know now, I think I could have done more reading, um, 
WebMD is a blessing and a curse. So I don't think that I'm dying, but I think that it would have helped me pinpoint some, some specific questions to ask. So do you feel that you'll be better armed now when you go in to see the endocrinologist? Yes, um, that's because I have learned to become my, my own expert. Um, the second I found out that I had multiple nodules on my thyroid, as well as the high TSH and autoantibodies, I found out every path that that could go down, um, what the sonogram meant, what the different dimensions were, whether they needed to do surgery or I looked at the whole thing and that's because that's the only way I'm going to know what questions to ask um, and how to put it together with um, my naturopath. And that's really important, isn't it? Just doing your own research and understanding that you, you're, you've got to be a very informed consumer of the medical services provided. And I think that's what a lot of people have trouble wrapping their mind around, that your doctor is a provider of a service, it's a business. And like any other business, there are better doctors and more informed doctors than others. And you really do have to go in there as a wise consumer and have your wits about you and be very well read about your own conditions so that you know how to ask the right questions and also to understand that you don't have to accept any treatment that's offered to you or what's given. You know, it really is up to you to do that research. Do you, so do you find your background, as you said, you know how to, to read the tests and do the tests, do you find that's really been an advantage for you? I think being able to know how to research and be able to pick apart a viable resource from one that may not be so viable, um, and also understanding that people that have blogs and do have symptoms aren't always going to share the same symptoms and experiences that I have even with the same diseases. Mm. Um, and I think it is a good thing that autoimmune autoimmunity has become more of a topic at the table than it was six or seven years ago when I was really starting to experience and go through all of the medical components. Mm. Okay. So living with an autoimmune disease can add a lot of challenges to the way we feel and particularly the way we relate to our bodies. You know, there, there's the weight gain, the lack of energy, you can have things like hair loss, skin issues as you have with the HS and exhaustion. And a lot of people say that they feel that their bodies have betrayed them or they feel really resentful and angry at their body for doing this to them. So. Has that changed your relationship with your body, particularly now that you have a diagnosis? I mean, having something for 20 years, how did you feel about your body then and how do you feel about your body now? I used to feel that there was nothing I could do to make myself feel or look better um, because when you have autoimmunity, and especially if it's paired with adrenal fatigue, working out actually makes you sicker. Um, and that was an issue that I experienced and everyone was trying to attribute it to, well, I'm lazy, I did the same thing, um, that, oh, I can't get myself up off the couch today to go exercise when really I had a hard time getting myself up off the couch at all. Um, so there was more of an understanding with my body and with the autoimmune paleo diet, I lost 40 pounds, I believe, in three months. And for me, it wasn't, yay, 30 pounds, I've dropped two dress sizes, excellent. It was my body is starting to function the way that it should. That was an indicator for me. Um, and now that my number has stabilized and I'm noticing that not all of my symptoms are going away, that's a, a key for me to say, all right, we need to do more investigation, which is when I brought on my naturopath. And that's a really important point that you just brought up there, Kerry, because, you know, I've had a similar thing myself. I think on my blog I've posted a before and after, you know, before Hashimoto's and after I knew Hashimoto's. And I've lost around 17 kilos, which is probably about um, close to 32 pounds or, or something like that. And 
as you say, it's it's secondary for me. Like it's lovely to be able to get back into clothes and things that I couldn't wear, but for me, it's a sign that my body is is working the way it should be, and I'm actually healing, and the inflammation is going down because generally, with the weight gain with an autoimmune disease, it's it's that inflammation based. So the gut is inflamed, all the organs are inflamed. There's strain, so you're not. You're not absorbing nutrients properly. You're not processing things properly. All the systems of the body are affected. So what would you say to people who are stuck on that, I have to lose weight, you know, forget everything else. If I could just lose weight with my autoimmune disease, it would be better. I think that's an idea that you have to let go of. Uh, and I think if you are looking to lose weight, it does help with a lot of autoimmunity symptoms, like with HS, the less skin that is rubbing together, the less that you may flare because of hot, humid weather, um, ill-fitting clothes. But if you're going to look to lose weight, then you need to make sure that you're doing it the right way and at the right time. My chiropractor made it very clear that I was not to exercise for the 30 days that I was on the AIP diet that I needed to replenish my system. And it wasn't until actually this year that a, a chiropractor of mine suggested, you know what, your adrenals look to be functioning fully. I think you can start doing some more strenuous exercise instead of just stretching and yoga, um, start working out a little bit, um, but also not overdoing it because the last thing you wanna do is try to put the number on the scale down and make yourself sick while doing that. Yes. And that's a really great point because you can actually make your condition and your health worse by just focusing on weight loss and trying to, to diet because if you're not absorbing the nutrients, then denying yourself, you know, good food or reducing the amount of food you're eating really means that you're not allowing your body to heal and it just keeps the whole cycle going. So I think that's really important points that you've made. And if I could say one more thing to that, I would also mention that eating the right food for you is really important. If you experience inflammation or joint pain after eating something, maybe it's your favorite food, but accepting that if, in order to feel better, this food needs to come off your plate. Um, that is something that's hard to do. We all have mom and grandma's favorite meals, um, but you have to be able to say it's not good for my body. Uh, my chiropractor actually told me that I wasn't eating enough food, that I wasn't eating a large enough quantity of food, um, but I was eating the wrong food. And that's a really important point too, that we do have that emotional attachment to food, don't we? And I know a lot of people are sort of say, oh, my God, this disease has already taken so much from me. How can I give up my favourite you know, food item, whatever it is? And I think you really have to make that mind shift. You know. And in my situation, I think because I was so sick um, and I was very close to, to dying, um, I was so sick that I was highly motivated to do anything that I could to get better so it was it was a no-brainer for me literally it felt like life or death it's either you change what you're doing now or you're going to die you're going to be disabled or or you keep doing what you're doing so it was like oh okay well i think i'm going to change my diet and but i know a lot of people are functioning and so they feel normal and they probably had their ad for a long time and it will feel like a major sacrifice to give up, you know, the, the gluten or the, you know, the dairy or whatever it is. So how did you work your way really to making that decision? Because you really have to come to it and just go, no, nah, no more. You really do. And what I had done before my first chiropractic appointment is I assumed that my life was about to change. And when that mindset came in, I cleared out my cupboard. The week before my appointment, I had anything that I knew I was going to miss. Um, and I wasn't sure even if the gluten-free items would be allowed on my diet. So I made myself um, a specialty mac and cheese um, and uh, cauliflower pizza with goat cheese. I, I lived it up quote unquote safely for the last week 
but with the understanding that it might be the last time. Uh, so when I came back home from the weekends uh, at my sister's house, I went grocery shopping and there wasn't anything in the cupboard anymore to tempt me. That decision had been made before I went to the appointment. Um, it has been difficult for me with dairy. Um, there are gluten-free items out there. There's lots of paleo cooking and coconut flour options, but there is no real substitute for dairy. Um, coconut cream for me does it for coffee. I like coconut ice cream, but cheese. I just, I can't, there's no replacement. <laughs> um, and so I, I allow myself to splurge. And one thing that I like about my naturopath is she said, if it doesn't bother you yet and you haven't seen any symptoms, eat it. Um, we may have to do the individualized IgE testing to see what I'm sensitive to um, for my autoimmune symptoms. So if I have to cross that bridge, I will do so when I get there. Um, probably having a block of cheese before that appointment though. And it really is that mindset, isn't it, that you've, you've got to get into, not just about what you eat, but about how you manage your life and your health, and particularly stress. Because stress in itself, you know, people sort of really don't understand that an autoimmune disease encompasses everything in your life, from, you know, any toxic things in your home, to the food that you eat, to your emotions, to the stress, and physically how hard you push yourself. And stress in itself can trigger an autoimmune disease. So have you actually made had to make lifestyle changes? I know you mentioned before that you did change your job, which is a massive thing to stop the stress of the travel. And you don't push yourself to exercise. What other things have you sort of found that you've had to change? I have to know my limits. And I also have to remind myself that where other people may be able to go days or weeks um, with little to no sleep because of projects or, or uh, work, children, um, that I have to stop myself much sooner. My reaction time is much quicker than someone that doesn't have an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to stress, I have to de-stress um, almost immediately um, because that will flare um, things in my body that I I just can't have happen. It'll just drag me backwards and I need to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, other lifestyle changes, work, stress. Um, if I feel myself getting sick, whether it's with the general cold or I feel my autoimmunity flaring, I stop. Where I used to feel very bad about calling out from work for something that felt minor, I now realize that if I don't stop and address it immediately, it's actually going to be worse and I'll miss more time from work. Yes, yes. And that's a big thing, isn't it? And, and one of the most difficult and frustrating parts of having an autoimmune disease is trying, you know, not just to get family and friends to understand, and I know that your family are very supportive, but with colleagues and other, other people, and because of the stress that could be caused by relationships, it's really important, I think, to evaluate the relationships in your life. And maybe there's some people that you have to let go because of the stress and the toxicity that they bring. I mean, have you found that you've had to maybe pull back from some people or some friendships have had to go? Yes. Um, I would say that I've done a lot of uh, housekeeping in the last year and a half um, and it has been painful initially sometimes it causes more stress in the beginning when you are breaking those friendships or stepping away from them um, or perhaps you're stepping away from people that have a lot of negativity in their own life and you're their rock or their anchor their go-to to speak to um, and you just need to be able to say you know what I need to step away um, try to end it amicably, but it really becomes a big issue of self-care, which is contradictory to everything that our society tells us. Mm. Absolutely. And it really does have to be about you. And, and I often say to, to my clients that you've got to be serious 
about your health and your life. You know, you have to be 100% committed to that. That's got to come first for you. And a lot of people say, oh, that's really selfish. And I said, well, actually, it's not. If you think about it, the analogy I like to use with my clients is, you know, think about yourself as a beautiful teacup on a saucer. And I get them to intuitively check in and say, okay, well, how, how full would your teacup be? And most of them would say, well, probably about half. You know, some even say their teacup is cracked. So we've got to work on, on building that up. And you put in the self-care. And with an autoimmune disease, it means all the things that you're talking about so that you eat for your body so that it's not sending off a flare, that you get rid of, you know, toxic things in the environment, including relationships and people and stress, that you adapt your work where you can, that you get your sleep, but also that you do all of that self-care stuff. And then as your cup fills up, you give from the saucer, from the overflow. So what you were saying is exactly right. It may seem like effort and stress in the, in the short term, but once you get that done and when you stop, like you said, when you realise, you know, I've got to stop it now, you, the rest of your week or your month is just you're going to have so much more energy, so much more to give, and you're going to be so much more present than if you'd pushed yourself or sacrificed yourself or, you know, made other people's needs more important than your own. So it really is getting that mindset, isn't it, about I have to look after me or I'm not going to be any use to anyone. Yes, there are times that I used to cancel plans with friends because I didn't have the energy, even if I really wanted to see them. Um, I was usually unhappy at work, and not because of the situation that I was in, just I was tired and I was sore, and I didn't want to be there because of those reasons. Um, and once I started going to the chiropractor and experiencing all of these changes, everybody started commenting about how more positive I was and how much uh, more efficient I was. And in fact, I had one person say, you finally feel like you're the person you were always supposed to be. Mm. And that was within two weeks of starting my treatment. Mm. And the change can be amazing. Um, I'm still finding that I'm I'm coming up next month. I think you no, know, in October will be my 12 month anniversary from you know being at my sickest um, point and starting to get into recovery. And I think a lot of people don't understand when you've had something for decades, right? And I I can look back now and say I probably had this when I was a child, which explained you know the, the sudden weight gain um, and thinking like yourself, I thought I wasn't motivated, I thought I, I, I just wasn't self-disciplined, I was lazy, I was all these different sorts of things because I found it really difficult to struggle, you know, struggled to focus and get things done and have that concentration. And it's a bit like now that I'm properly medicated and I've changed my diet and I've reduced everything that I can that's, that's flaring me. It's like if you can imagine like a big panel of lights and all of your life, you've been living with them half on and you thought that was normal. And then all of a sudden, these little lights start coming on and you're going, wow, you know, I can, I get up in the morning now and I can focus and, you know, I, I feel motivated to do things. And so a lot of people I find are thinking there's something just lacking in them when really it's their disease. And when they start getting back on track and they start looking after themselves and they get the right medication and they get the right help and the right diet and all of those things, it's like there's this, you access this new level, particularly a mental um, for me, um, being able to focus and function because I think a lot of people don't realise how debilitating brain fog is. I mean, can you tell, tell everyone what it was like with brain fog for you? Um especially the driving part of my job in admission it's difficult to get up with uh, chronic autoimmunity but just not being able to focus and having projects that you know need to get done but at the same time your brain is focusing on 50,000 different things that have nothing to do with what you need to do um, and 
there's also this level of consciousness in there of realizing, seeing that dichotomy in yourself of, wow, I really need to do something, but I can't focus on this. And there can be a guilt associated to that. So while you're experiencing this confusion and otherworldness, you're also quite grounded in the reality of that. Mm. Mm. And it can be quite scary as well. In the height of my illness, you know, when all I could do was sort of get out of bed, um, drive my son to school and then come back and sit on the couch. And that was literally my world because I couldn't really do anything else. I found myself doing stupid things. Like, you know, one day I was dropping my son off at school and I started driving off before he'd closed the door. And he was yelling out, Mom, what are you doing? And, and I, was, I just, my brain was so dead that I didn't realise. I felt like I was, had this slow reaction to everything. And a lot of people don't understand that. And so the, if they don't have the awareness that autoimmune disease actually creates that inflammation in the brain that causes the brain fog, it's not them. You know, they're not absent-minded, they're not stupid, they're not lazy, they're not lacking in motivation. They have an illness that's affecting their brain. I think sometimes because autoimmunity is often labeled by the organ that it's affecting, that it's not obvious to the casual observer what's going on with an individual. I would have never put together my uh, stomach discomfort and my lack of focus together it with celiac. There would have been no connection there whatsoever uh, until I started experiencing it and having and had it point out to me that, by the way, this is what's going on with your body. Um, I know that as I was sitting in the chiropractor's office the first time, I felt as though I should have picked up on it myself. Um, just because a lot of what was covered was basic anatomy one and two from college. There was nothing overly difficult about it. It was connecting the dots. Um, and because I was so deep into it, I couldn't see myself. Um, but a lot of people wouldn't have understood what was going on because not even the medical profession fully understands what's going on. Exactly. And, um, you know, we don't see that. And I think... Because autoimmune disease can be so gradual in onset and it's rare for somebody to have only one, you know, most of us have two or three. I have three myself um, at the moment and I've probably had celiac probably before I think I got the, the Hashimoto's. So we become so gradually used to the very slow decline that it becomes our normal because prior to me actually getting so sick, I was one of those people who said, I never get sick. I'm always healthy. I'm never at the doctors. So I felt like a healthy person, even though looking back now, I can see clearly that I wasn't. So I think it's, it's not that process of connecting the dots that you were talking about. In hindsight, looks so clear. But at the time you're in it, that's how you normally feel. So you don't have a comparison point, but so you look for explanations elsewhere, which is, oh, well, I'm lazy, I'm unmotivated, I'm undisciplined, I'm this, I'm, I'm that. I mean, would you agree that's been your experience? Yes, there was that, and I was 25 years old at the time, um, and so I thought, well, maybe this is just what it's like to get older, and mm. wow, this is terrible. <laughs> mm. And that sounds ridiculous, but I've actually heard from people around your age and maybe 30 whose doctors have actually said to them, oh, that's just part of getting older, which is absolutely scary when you think about it. I, I was checked for chronic fatigue syndrome and sleep apnea. My iron levels were checked and we, we addressed the specific iron deficiency anemia but not in context with anything else. It was one blood test, uh, one set of symptoms, uh, one diagnosis. Mm -hmm. That was it. There was no digging deeper. There was no looking at my thyroid or anything that could be inhibiting iron absorption. It's just I'm a female of childbearing age. It's common. Here's what we do. Yes, yes. And that's exactly what my doctor said to me when he told me my thyroid was dead. You know, and he said, oh, it just happens. It just, just happens to people as they get older. It just happens. And I was sitting there going, no, nothing just happens. 
there must be a reason why this happened. It, it just doesn't come out of the blue. There must be something that's that's created this and that sort of set me on my journey to sort of dig deeper and, and find out what my root cause was and do whatever I could to address that. So, Carrie, we've talked a little bit about, you know, relationships and work and things like that. You know, what would be your advice to somebody's family and friends that had an, an autoimmune disease? I mean, what would you really like to sit them down and, and tell them, like their partner, their family, their friends, on how to support somebody with an autoimmune disease? If you think the ride has been interesting to this point, it's only going to be more interesting from here out. Um, I'm sure that depending on what the person is dealing with, the family also deals with the, the clumsiness, the brain fog, uh, seeing the effects of that, and then also seeing somebody they love in pain. Um, and it's very important to understand that this is going to be a journey um, where they're going to get a lot of different medical advice. There's going to be a lot of self-discovery in amounts of stress that they can handle, what foods they can or cannot eat, um, and just realizing that it's going to be a fluid journey. Something could change tomorrow that wasn't brought up today, um, and understanding that for me, there was a point where I could joke about it, and there was a point when I was un understanding what was happening and accepting what was happening that I wasn't ready to joke about it. Um, and I think that comes with just knowing that person that you love. Um, and also creating a space for that person to talk openly about what's going on because there are so many different emotions when you start going through this. The anger, the feelings of betrayal at your body, um, maybe some hopelessness or helplessness at the beginning when you realize that I have this for the rest of my life uh, and letting them work through that in an honest way and also finding um, how in your family you can support them whether it's you change around chores who does what um, who takes the kids to work uh, who cooks a dinner for me I do a lot of batch cooking I enjoy cooking um, it's a pleasure of mine. If somebody else would do the dishes for me, that would make my day. Um, just little things like that because I, I read something online about the spoon theory. Essentially, those of us with autoimmunity start out with so many spoons at the beginning of the day, and we have to pay a spoon every time we do something. Um, just having somebody do the dishes saves me two or three spoons. It, it, on bad days, it can be very taxing for me to do something that simple. And to make that known to the people that you're living with or that you um, experience a lot of life events with, that something that is very easy and seamless for you can be difficult for me, especially if I'm having a bad day. And that's so true because a lot of us, you know, can look really well, you know, and people can't see it past that. They say, you look fine, you look normal. So the fact that you you know have something that is affecting you just seems to go over their head. And you're absolutely right in saying that there is a, there is a grief process that you go through. When you get a diagnosis and somebody says, this is for life, it's never gonna go away. You may have multiple ones. You may have to be relying on medication for the rest of your life. Um, it may progress into other things. Um, you know, you may end up losing some parts of your body or, or something like that. It's a massive shock and you do need time to process it. And I know for me it was incredibly traumatic and one of the, the things that really helped me and which is why I sort of started Emotional Autoimmunity was I was really looking for people who'd already had been dealing with that to say how do you come to terms with that emotionally how do you wrap your mind around it how do you get over the grief of sort of understanding that the old life that you had before has gone and now you've got this new life that you've got to create with whatever limitations that you're living with I think you have to start looking at it not as limitations, but just the lifestyle change. Um, 
there was one point where I was very angry about what was going on, that I was giving up so much and that I was so limited, um, especially when it came to food, where cooking is a joy for me, cooking for my family is something I enjoy doing. Um, in fact, I'm sure that I'll have to make my father something for fixing my computer tonight, but that's not a problem for me. Um, but I also have to understand myself in that, yes, I cannot have those things, but I'm also forced to be more creative with my cooking. Um, I've tried many different things that I would never have tried to eat before. Um, I've had some major mishaps with my cooking. Um, then I've also had some great experiences that my whole family have enjoyed. Mm. And I it found is. that as well. We were we were having a beautiful um, slow cooked uh, pork sage recipe with this coconut milk um, that I got from um, Sophia to squirrel in the kitchen because I love her blog. And uh, we were all sitting there just like, oh my god, this is just so fabulous. And I was like, well, guys, if I hadn't got sick, you know, we wouldn't have been eating this fantastic food. <laughs> so you know, even though my diet was pretty healthy before. Um, I think it really helps me in particular to sort of say, okay, I was eating those foods for 40 something years of my life. So I know what they taste like and I could eat them if I want to, but I choose not to. And I think if you say it's a choice rather than I have to give something up, it's just a, a really more empowering reframe to say, well, I could choose to eat that and if I choose to eat that, I'm going to experience some pretty horrible consequences. <laughs> so it, it feels better for me to make a more affirming choice and say, well, I'm going to still eat really delicious food. And, and I have actually been able to adapt a lot of the recipes I had before without too much effort. So unlike you, I don't love cooking, but I, I enjoy the result of the cooking. <laughs> so... What's the one thing, Kerry, if you could sort of sum it up, if you were going to giving advice to anybody who's watching this, what's the one thing that you've done that's made the biggest difference for you and your life and your health? Find an online community um, that whether it's the same diagnosis, the same autoimmune disease, the same diet, find an online community because that's where you're going to find the most support. Um, I live in rural Maine. The town that I'm sitting in only has 900 people in it. Mm -hmm. um, so the chances of me finding somebody who has a diagnosis, um, given that we have the same healthcare providers, would be slim. However, the internet allows for us to speak to people halfway across the world uh, that are actually in a different day than us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of good work being done. Uh, here in the US and I know in the UK they're moving forward with some functional medicine autoimmunity um, research um, and you find all of that information by first just discovering one group uh, for me it was Hashimoto's 411 on Facebook it was a recommendation by my chiropractor and from there I branched out into uh, Mickey Prescott and the autoimmune paleo diet um, Rob Wolf. It, it's one starting point um, to get you all of this information. And also, uh, there are a lot of websites out there that are specific to diets or to maybe the scientific medical side. Um, and that's where you want to go, just one starting point. And that's really, really good advice. And I know finding people who are going through the same thing as you, I mean, it really is true that you don't get it until you get it, you know, and and to have people who can say, oh, my God, I'm so exhausted, and they know what you're talking about. They know you're not just talking about normal tiredness. You're talking about exhaustion at a cellular level when you just feel you've got nothing to, you know, to pump your body. Um, so being with people is a great experience when they get that because you go, oh my God, I had that and I felt that and I experienced that and you had that. And so it's not me, it's part of the, the disease. And you can find out, I know con constantly in the forums that I'm in, somebody will post something and other people will go, oh my God, is that a symptom? 
of Hershey's, I never knew that was a symptom. I didn't know that was part of it. So you can almost see the relief fall away from them. They go, oh, wow. You know, it's not, it, it is part of this. Nobody ever told me that. And, and I think when you have the illness yourself, you're highly motivated to find out and stay on top of the research and stay on top of what's coming out. And I think this is a fantastic time to have an autoimmune disease because there is so many resources out there and is this, there is that global communication. They are the recipes and the health and, you know, the support. It's all out there. And really all you have to do is, is just get out there and start looking. But my recommendation to anybody is to try and stay away from the doom and gloom stories because there's a lot of people out there on the internet sort of drowning and really suffering and to try and focus your source your search on the positive stuff that was what really helped me when i started narrowing my search into you know recovery from or remission from or you know living well with and things like that and when you put that in to your google search you're going to find those really positive resources and i share a few of the ones that you have as well I found that one resource for me was, um, I can't recall the author, but the book is The Hidden Plague, and it's all about HS. And yes. a lot of it hit home with me because she went through not only the medical pieces, the, the mechanics, if you will, but also how it feels to be a person with HS for 20 years and to be ignored by the medical community, to be shamed. Um, by those around you, including your doctors and physicians. Um, and that, for me, was a book that I laughed at. Uh, I cried while I was reading it. Um, and I also got a lot of good information. Um, so I think you are right that if there was a time to have an autoimmune disease, that this would be the time. I think we're starting to emerge. Um, and I will be interested to see how fast insurance carriers keep up the pace with the functional medicine practitioners. Mm. Yes, it's certainly interesting times. And I know when I was talking to Joanna in the last interview, she actually mentioned that book as well, that she found that one. And that changed everything for her because up until then she had no idea. Um, and it, it was a real um, revelation. And I think it's fantastic that there's more and more people out there who are writing openly and honestly um, about these things and thank God we've got access to that information because it's just it gives you the power then doesn't it Kerry it gives you the, the power to take your life and your health into your own hands and just think yeah I have something what can I do about it yes I think a lot of times we put that power and that trust into our doctors uh, they are the ones that train for this they are the ones that are supposed to see us uh, as we are and I think we expect them to peel back the layers uh, if we tell them that we're not feeling well, not realizing that they don't have the time, some of them, to sit and really get into a discussion with you about, okay, you went to Greece six years ago. How would that have affected your health? Or, oh, you started your menstrual cycle when you were nine years old. Let's look to see if there was a hormonal imbalance that could have caused that or what could be happening now. Nobody really sits and talks to you about your full medical history. It's more than just um, the broken bones and the surgeries and, and the colds and the antibiotics. It really is what has happened in your life. And that's why I felt that it was so important to bring a naturopath into the equation um, because it's at least an hour that you sit down and you just talk about everything. Um, and my naturopath asked me some very pointed questions that nobody had asked before, not even my chiropractor. Um, and she really forced me to think about, oh wow, that could have been a trigger, that could have been something that I didn't notice. Um, mm. And it was all just from sitting with me as a person for 60 minutes. Yes. And I have a fantastic naturopath as well. And one of the first things that he really did for me, because I knew gut healing was going to be a really big part of me starting to recover, was I gave him all of my medical tests and he read through them all and he explained them to me, which doctors don't have the time to do. And he picked up things in my tests that no other doctor had picked up. 
and started to put them together so that they made sense and it was like ah so you know here's a really really important part of my healthcare team and I think it's you've got to go outside of your doctor and you've got to look to other really good support and get this you know support team with you and yes at the same time you've got to have that relationship where you're an equal partner because at the end of the day you're going to be the one who's going to wear the effects of any treatment or any medication or or anything that they miss you're the one who's going to suffer not them so it really does pay to be to get people on side and and to have this healthcare team who can work with you yes i would agree my naturopath is the one that requested the panel of testing um, complete metabolic panel um, my immunoglobin counts um, my specific ones um, my a1c even because diabetes does run in my family but looking to see if there's any damage being done now to catch it um, a complete blood cell count uh, a three-day stool specimen collection um, to rule out any parasites um, or bacterial infections no one had ever thought to do that before uh, in fact when I found out that I had hypothyroidism I as a result of the Hashimoto's I asked for a lipid panel to be done because often those of us with hypothyroidism have higher cholesterol and if nothing else I thought it would be a good baseline where I'm young to, to keep an eye on things I had to fight with my primary care provider to get that testing done. Um, whereas my naturopath actually applauded my foresight and my forward thinking into, yeah, that's actually a really good number. We should have that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the team is really important and keeping a good relationship with everybody on the team because you're not going to get everything from everybody on that team. That's exactly right. You, there's not going to be one person who's going to give you everything you need. So the onus really is on us, I think, as, as the people who are solely in charge of our health and our happiness to, you know, to really to be well researched and to seek advice. And if you're not a person who can research, then there are a whole lot of people in the support groups who can. You know, there are people who do brilliant research in there and that is where a lot of the new information and, and the groundbreaking stuff comes out but on the other hand of that also as I said with anything you've got to be a very cautious consumer I think just because something works for somebody else doesn't mean that you know you suddenly start trying this supplement or, or this or, or whatever you've really actually got to look at your own baseline and say well yeah I'm, ac I'm actually lacking in that because I think a lot of people take that shotgun approach when they just think Everybody tell me what you're doing and I'll do exactly the same thing. And then they don't get the same result. Yes, it, it really is, as my chiropractor said, it is person specific. What makes Carrie Hafford tick is going to be much different than what Carrie Jeffrey um, uses. Mm. Um, and it's that individualized approach where understanding if something doesn't work for you, it's not the end of the world. Try something else, mm -hmm. um, but also don't buy into a lot of the hype. Um, one vitamin doesn't cure all, one pill doesn't cure all, um, and even the medicine that we have for whatever ails us uh, from the conventional side, I'm on levothyroxine, that's not the end all either. That's not where you should stop your treatment. Mm, exactly, and I think that's really good advice. I think you, you still need to be um, in control of yourself and really committed to your health and looking at all those other factors in your life not just the medication or the supplements that you're taking but you know your relationships um, how well you're managing your sleep how well you know you're you're not pushing yourself and um, give yourself a break about your weight and the other things and just think you know my body needs to heal and it's my job I mean that's the approach I take my body needs to heal and it's my job to create the best environment that's going to allow it to do that. And I think that's really, really important for people to do that on their individual level. So this has been a wonderful chat, Kerry. Thank you so much for talking to me. And it's been a real delight. And I'm sure lots of people are going to get so much information about everything you've shared. So thank you very much for that.
Thank you for having me. And I uh, look forward to following your progress. So keep me posted how you go with the endo. I will. Thank you. Have a, a good day in Australia, I believe. I will. It is daytime, yes. I'll have a fabulous day and you have a lovely evening. And I'll talk to you soon, Gary. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.